I consider the freedom or moral strength of the individual mind as the supreme good and the highest end of government. I am aware that other views are often taken. It is said that government is intended for the public, for the community, not for the individual. The idea of a national interest prevails in the minds of statesmen, and to this it is thought that the individual may be sacrificed. But I would maintain that the individual is not made for the state so much as the state for the individual. A man is not created for political relations as his highest end, but for indefinite spiritual progress, and is placed in political relations as the means of his progress. The human soul is greater, more sacred than the state, and must never be sacrificed to it. The human soul is to outlive all earthly institutions. The distinction of nations is to pass away. Thrones which have stood for ages are to meet the doom pronounced upon all man's works. But the individual mind survives, and the obscurest subject, if true to God, will rise to power never wielded by earthly potentates. A human being is a member of the community, not as a limb is a member of the body, or as a wheel is a part of a machine, intended only to contribute to some general joint result. He was created not to be merged in the whole, as a drop in the ocean, or as a particle of sand on the seashore, and to aid only in composing a mass. He is an ultimate being, made for his own perfection as his highest end, made to maintain an individual existence and to serve others only as far as consists with his own virtue and progress. Hitherto governments have tended greatly to obscure this importance of the individual, to depress him in his own eyes, to give him the idea of an outward interest more important than the invisible soul, and of an outward authority more sacred than the voice of God in his own secret conscience. Rulers have called the private man the property of the state, meaning generally by the state themselves, and thus the many have been immolated to the few, and have even believed that this was their highest destination. These views cannot be too earnestly withstood. Nothing seems to me so needful as to give to the mind the consciousness which governments have done so much to suppress of its own separate worth. Let the individual feel that through his immortality he may concentrate in his own being a greater good than that of nations. Let him feel that he is placed in the community not to part with his individuality or to become a tool, but that he should find a sphere for his various powers and a preparation for immortal glory. To me, the progress of society consists in nothing more 
than in, br than in bringing out the individual, in giving him a consciousness of his own being and in quickening him to strengthen and elevate his own mind. The advantages of civilization have their peril. In such a state of society, opinion and law impose salutary restraint and produce general order and security. But the power of opinion grows into a despotism, which more than all things represses original and free thought, subverts individuality of character, reduces the community to a spiritless monotony, and chills the love of perfection. Religion, considered simply as the principle which balances the power of human opinion, which takes man out of the grasp of custom and fashion, and teaches him to refer himself to a higher tribunal, is an infinite aid to moral strength and elevation. An important benefit of civilization, of which we hear much from the political economist, is the division of labor by which arts are perfected. But this, by confining the mind to an unceasing round of petty operations, tends to break it into littleness. We possess improved fabrics, but deteriorated men. Another advantage of civilization is that manners are refined and accomplishments multiplied, but these are continually seen to supplant simplicity of character, strength of feeling, the love of nature, the love of inward beauty and glory. Under outward courtesy, we see a cold selfishness, a spirit of calculation and little energy of love. I confess I look round on civilized society with many fears and with more and more earnest desire that a regenerating spirit from heaven, from religion, may descend upon and pervade it. I particularly fear that various causes are acting powerfully among ourselves to inflame and madden that enslaving and degrading principle, the passion for property. For example, the absence of hereditary distinctions in our country gives prominence to the distinction of wealth and holds up this as the chief prize to ambition. In order, however, that religion should yield its full and best fruit, one thing is necessary, and the times require that I should state it with great distinctness. It is necessary that religion should be held and professed in a liberal spirit. Just as far as it assumes an intolerant, exclusive, sectarian form, it subverts instead of strengthening the soul's freedom and becomes the heaviest and most galling yoke which is laid on the intellect and conscience. Religion must be viewed not as a monopoly of priests, ministers or sects, not as conferring on any man a right to dictate to his fellow beings, not as an instrument by which the few may awe the many, not as bestowing on one a prerogative which is not enjoyed by all, but as the property of every human being and as the great subject 
for every human mind. It must be regarded as the revelation of a common father to whom all have equal access, who invites all to the like immediate communion, who has no favorites, who has appointed no infallible expounders of his will, who opens his works and word to every eye and calls upon all to read for themselves and to follow fearlessly the best convictions of their own understandings. Let religion be seized on by individuals or sects as their special province. Let them clothe themselves with God's prerogative of judgment. Let them succeed in enforcing their creed by penalties of law or penalties of opinion. Let them succeed in fixing a brand on virtuous men whose only crime is free investigation and religion becomes the most blighting tyranny which can establish itself over the mind. You have all heard of the outward evils which religion, when thus turned into tyranny, has inflicted. How it has dug dreary dungeons, kindled fires for the martyr, and invented instruments of exquisite torture. But to me, all this is less fearful than its influence over the mind. When I see the superstitions which it has fastened on the conscience, the spiritual terrors with which it has haunted and subdued the ignorant and susceptible, the dark, appalling views of God which it has spread far and wide, the dread of inquiry which it has struck into superior understandings, and the civility of spirit which it has made to pass for piety. When I see all this, the fire, the scaffold, and the outward inquisition, terrible as they are, seem to me inferior evils. I look with a solemn joy on the heroic spirits who have met freely and fearlessly pain and death in the cause of truth and human rights. But there are other victims of intolerance on whom I look with unmixed sorrow. They are those who, spellbound by early prejudice or by intimidations from the pulpit and the press, dare not think, who anxiously stifle every doubt or misgiving in regard to their opinions, as if to doubt were a crime, who shrink from the seekers after truth as from infection, who deny all virtue which does not wear the livery of their own sect, who, surrendering to others their best powers, receive unresistingly a teaching which wars against reason and conscience, and who think it a merit to impose on such as live within their influence the grievous bondage which they bear themselves. How much to be deplored is it that religion, the very principle which is designed to raise men above the judgment and power of man, should become the chief instrument of usurpation over the soul.